straight on in with uh, no comments. Sorry, now I'm hitting the record button. And, uh, and then we'll open it up to you, the audience. You can either raise your hand to ask your question to Laura live, or you can uh, type in uh, the chat box or the Q&A box and I can read them out to Laura. So great, thank you, Laura. I'm looking forward to the presentation. The floor is now yours. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Amanda, for inviting me to New Voices. And, and really, it is, uh, it is such an honor to have my presentation discussed by you. Um, and before I start my presentation, I thought it would be appropriate to display this little content warning because I will be discussing crisis and kind of touching on issues of racism. Um, and, uh, and if you know that you are reacting especially you know, sensitively to these issues, then I would um, suggest you know, either to skip on this presentation or I'm also displaying uh, King's Wellbeing resources uh, to, to come back to. And uh, yeah, the, the title of my presentation today, today is The Crisis of the Every Days, Crisis Management and the Illusion of Wide Futurity. Um, so a little background on my thesis. So the subject of my thesis is the crisis of the avid days, or synonymously, the crisis of social reproduction, which I will be explaining in a minute. And what you see here um, in this presentation slide is, 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 my, is my thesis in, an, in, in a sentence. So in a nutshell, I will be looking into how neoliberal and modern and decolonial knowledges respond to the question, what are crises? And how do we best deal with them? And then I compare them based on their potential in it to understand and to offer solutions to, to, to the crisis of the other days. And in today's presentation, I will be discussing my research puzzle only. So to flag, I'm a pre-upgrade um, student and my talk will be restricted to outlining that one fundamental problematic that kind of animates my research. And that is how comes that designated crisis managers, that is, you know, who, who might be sitting in governments, in consulting firms, in think tanks or scientific advisory groups, who, who do not really seem to, to, to know much about or, or care about the crisis of the every days. And this is very curious because the severity and the magnitude of, of what we know today about this crisis by far outweighs the attention it receives. So my question is, why is that so? And by why is that so, I mean uh, that I'm interested in carving out the stakes, that is, what is at stake for whom in addressing or not addressing this crisis? And in fact, when we look closely, there seems to be really an ontological conflict even between the crisis of the everyday, meaning what it is and where it, uh, where it comes from, and the goal and means of today's dominant articulation of crisis and crisis solving, which presents itself with a neoliberal mo modern episte uh, epistemic genealogy. And the goal of today's presentation is to try to get a preliminary grip on that conflict, as to what that conflict is and where to find it. And, to, and I try to encapsulate that conflict in what I call the illusion of my futurity. So from experience, the very first question I get when I start to talk about my thesis is, well, what is the crisis of the everydays? And uh, what do I mean by everydays? It is such a difficult to pin down notion. And how do the everydays have possibly anything to do with whiteness and white futurity? And in my thesis, I'm using the analytical lens of social reproduction to outline the crisis of the everydays as sharply and make it as tangible as possible. And so social reproduction comes from feminist theory, and it means a wide range of everyday activities or behaviors, you know, such as cooking, cleaning, caring for dependent, for dependent relatives in a community, or socializing children. So on the bottom line, social reproductive activities and behaviors are caring and life-giving and life-maintaining activities that happen on a daily and household and community level. And they are the precondition of existence of actually any society in the world, no matter its political, economic form of governments. And what makes them caring and life-giving and life-maintaining uh, is that they arise from a stance, from a way of being in the world that affirms life in its corporeality, its situatedness, its relationality. This means life lived for its own sake. Um, and I'm very happy to elaborate on that maybe when it comes to it to, in, in, during the Q&A. 
But what does it mean for the everydays to be in crisis? They are in crisis when we are systematically cut off from the material, but also mental and emotional resources necessary to carry out social reproduction of reproducing the everydays. That means not being able to successfully live through the everydays. And that means encountering a premature death. Talking, you know, I'm talking about the lack of monetary uh, uh, means. I'm talking physical and mental exhaustion or unlivable and toxic natural environments. And how it comes that the everydays are in crisis today on a global scale? And as far as, as we know, thanks to critical scholars, the ontology of social reproduction of the everydays, you know, being corporeal, situated and relational clashes with that of current capitalist political economic ontology, which promotes, um, as many decolonial, uh, decolonial scholars note, disembodiment, universality and individuality, and in consequence, embodied, situated and relational or communal ways of knowing and being in the world become associated with femininity and weakness. They might be treated as disposable, less rewarded, less valued, less paid attention to, or even intentionally eradicated. Think of epistemicides. And this attitude is encapsulated in the term backwardness, historically used to describe native and in general later non-European ways of knowing and uh, being. And the term backward alerts us to a linear conception underlying modernity's idea of time, uh, which positions whiteness and maleness in the sense of a political economic, racialized and gender power relation in the realm of the future, the real be, and relegates others into the realm of the past in the developmentalist sense of a not yet. And as Sarah Smith and Pavitra Vasudeva note, the epistemological grammar of backward and advanced centers futurity in the white subject and disqualifies non-white subjects from full humanity and thus forward-oriented agency. And we can see how this power relation plays out in the crisis of the early days, which disproportionately affects precarious women and people of color because it is them who carry out most of the world's social reproductive work, because, it is, because they are the ones who mop our floors, sew our clothes, deliver our food to our doors, and fill the world's granaries. And these often under impossible conditions because these are the people at the same time who are affected most by, by white futurity in practice, right? Think of, uh, of uh, IMF and World Bank uh, induced structural adjustment programs. Think of displacement, of disruption, disruption of community ties, of land grab. Um, so how is this crisis felt and experienced? So this crisis is felt as the impossibility to distinguish everyday life from a state of crisis or emergency. So the crisis, the crisis of the everyday is experienced as a chronic, a perpetual crisis on a material, affective, and mental and emotional level. And interestingly, as you can see in these slides, the crisis of the everyday is increasingly voiced as such by those who experience it. And now logically, because social reproductive activities are the precondition to our present capitalist modality to function. In fact, for any political economic uh, uh, arrangement to function, we could assume that this crisis would figure on top uh, of, of policymakers, you know, think tanks and consulting firms' agendas, who are after or, or appointed crisis managers. But why isn't that so? And this brings me to a second part of my presentation, where I will be approaching the, the same research question from a different perspective, namely from what I conceptualize as the neoliberal modern crisis management. What is that? So the relevant, that means widely accepted idea of what crises are and how we need to deal with them, comes from the theory and practice of business and management. So the field of crisis management began as simple business practice, uh, with books emerging on crisis management by the neoliberal turn of the 20th century, written mainly by men identified CEOs, presidents, and partners of consulting firms, uh, mainly located in the United States and the United Kingdom. And it swept over into academia where it became a discipline in its own right, but without really changing its basic assumptions. And in this literature, we can say that there is a consensus of what makes a crisis a crisis. And there are three much cited definitions of crisis that I find particularly interesting because they don't just try to categorize, you know, a pandemic can be a crisis, you know, 
an earthquake can induce crisis, but they really try to pin down the very essence of what makes any situation a crisis. And in these definitions, different potential crisis phenomena have one crucial characteristic in common, namely that unspecified situations become crisis when they have the power to acutely endanger basic structures, act the existential core, the core identity, the soul or the fundamental norms underlying a system, be it an organization or a society, which needs rescuing from the crisis. But, but what are those basic structures and existential core and fundamental norms that we are talking about? Because I think that in order to understand how crisis management today thinks and works, we need to understand those. Um, and, I, and I'm going to single out here, uh, specifically Rosenthal and Kuzmin's writing, the, the, the fundamental norms, uh, because I, I, I find them very helpful and, and probably the easiest to look into. Um, so what I wonder here is, what is a norm? And whether we mean legal norms, laws, standards, or traditional customs, a norm is always a guidance towards that which is good or desirable. And Foucaultian scholar Kelly captures that very well when he says that a norm is a model of perfection that operates as a guide to action in any particular sphere of activity. And then Michel Foucault himself tells us that we define and perceive normal and abnormal based on the norm that underlies our perspective. So applied to the previous definitions of crisis, we can say that neoliberal modern crisis management in the last instance is nothing else but the reasserting of the future by disciplining that which is abnormal of that which is named crisis to reconfirm to the ruling norms that safeguarding that norm. And here the question that imposes is that well, where can we find the norm underlying this articulation, this specific articulation of crisis and crisis solving? Where we can, in fact, where we can find norms in the Foucauldian sense of a model of perfection at all? Can we find them in laws? Can we find them in constitutions? Can we find them in urban landscapes? And I, I'm certain that we can find the norms in all of these if we care to look close enough, but I also suggest that in the most distilled uh, most essentialized forms, norms can be found in origin stories or mythoi. Yes, I indeed mean those original origin stories that we, sure we have all come across uh, at some point. Think of the Abrahamic religions, Adam and Eve. So origin stories explain who we are. And the colonial feminist scholar Sylvia Winter tells us the exceptionality of human beings is their incapacity to pre-exist our origin stories. So ironically, that means that human beings invent origin stories and then project them onto their past. And this makes humans exceptional bios and mythoi, or as Franz Fanon has famously put it, skin and mask hybrid beings. So the mask or the mythoi provide the interpretation to our skin or bios. In other words, origin stories harbor a norm, an idealized myth of what the humans are and what we are supposed to strive towards becoming and what the world around us is and is supposed to be like. And as Sylvia Winter notes, the human of today's colonial capitalist world system is supposed to embody the mythoi, to strive towards the norm or wear the mask of homo economicus. And the homo economicus is ironically, as many feminist scholars have noted, the embodiment of the disembodied, the universal, and accumulating white and male gendered atomized individuals. So homo economicus is basically this essential image of white futurity. And homo economicus, the mask or the norm then, is brought to life or translated into mater materiality <laughs> or skin via the capitalist modality. And I suggest that in, 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 in this specific articulation of crisis that we have, that we have seen, uh, the neoliberal modern articulation, I suggest that because it is native 
to the ontology of the modern capitalist value system, the norm, the fundamental norm, the, the, the basic structure, the, the essential core, and the goal of crisis management would be homo economicus. That means the capitalist modality itself. In other words, whether a situation is deemed normal or crisis would depend on whether the situation is perceived as norm sustaining, that is normal, or norm contesting, that is crisis, in relation to the colonial capitalist modality. And this conception of crisis is actually very reflected in a quote by Otto Labinger, who says that a crisis is an event that brings or has the potential for bringing an organization or a system into disrepute and imperils its future profitability, growth, and possibly its very survival. So against this background, I ask, where can we find the crisis of the everyday in this articulation of crisis? And for this, we need to find out where the crisis of the everyday is positioned in relation to the norm. That means, is the crisis of the everyday norm sustaining or norm contesting in relation to the, to, to that, to the capitalist modality? And in how far? Now, now, this is an analysis and a discussion that I will be rooting in my empirical case studies of the COVID-19 pandemic and the global financial crisis in the UK in my thesis. But I can say that my prelim preliminary insight and basically my pre-field work research that has obviously led me to formulating this research puzzle in the first place suggests that the crisis of the everyday is rather non-sustaining. And not only that, instead of being a goal of crisis management, uh, feminist scholars have ex explored in depth how it is rather a tool of crisis management. Think about the gendered and raised and class effects of austerity politics that are imp implemented as a reply to crisis for capital. So in my cases, I will look into if and how this ontological conflict uh, between crisis management as we know today and, and the crisis of, everyday, of, of the everyday empirically plays out in these two crisis phenomena. But I could stop here, but I think I still have one or two minutes left. And so I would like I would like to use them to um, to, to dwell a little bit more on my on my research puzzle. Um, because really what I'm wondering is all the time, how is this conflict possible? on an ontological level in the first place. So really, where is the bug in the ontological codings of homo economicus that legitimizes this? And for the sake of consistency in this presentation, I will be recurring to Sylvia Winters and Franz Fanon's work to guide my thinking. So Fanon's sociogenic inquiry concerned the specifics of the psychopathology of the Black person which resulted from being figuratively forced upon like white mask by power relations that rendered blackness ontologically impossible. And based on Sylvia Winder, I suggested a similar psychopathology. In fact, an incommensurability between skin and mask can also be found in the ontological codings of homo economicus. So if the psychopathology of Fanon's black man can be symbolically resumed in the image of black skin, white mask, then the psychopathology of the colonial capitalist, uh, you know, homo economicus can be symbolically resumed in the image of white skin, no mask. Whiteness pretends to wear no mask at all. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe some of my future readers um, would be bewildered by the idea that I suggest that capitalist societies are carried by a myth, an origin story. And until very recently, I, I would have been one of them. And this is, I think, one of many symptoms of an ontology that pretends to, to, to have no myth and to have no mask. And the result is that homo economicus is then projected as a natural essence of the human. So in short, the myth is that there is no myth. The myth is that capitalism is a natural, organic, and unavoidable fact. And I suggest that those who suffer the crisis of the everyday are precisely those who suffer the physical, the affective, mental, and emotional consequences of this myth, of this psychopathology of homo economicus. And interestingly, Louis R. Gordon, another Fanonian scholar, um, calls Fanon's wretched of the earth the disastrous people. 
people who modern coloniality have become disaster. And I wonder who are the disastrous people if not those who live in permanent crisis, if not those who become the living embodiments of disaster. However, if people come to embody crisis, they cannot possibly figure on the side of humanity that our crisis managers need to rescue, but on the side that the protected norms need rescuing from. And this quote by Nelson Maldonado Torres in the context of the roads must fall, a decolonized higher education protest, I think shows very well how fine and fluid the dividing line between, you know, normalized people and those who embody crisis is. And indeed, the frequency which it's, you know, cri which our crisis managers are called upon whenever the disastrous people protest against norms and physically move closer to norm centers, for instance, through immigration and asylum seeking. And also the criminalization of solidarity. I think it is both eye-opening and alerting to an imagining of crisis and crisis management that imposes futurity as either ontologically white or not at all. And the question is, that carries my thesis, how could we solve the crisis of the everydays on a structural level? And I suggested acknowledging the crisis of the everydays as a crisis in its own right would be a good start. But I also think that for this, we need to look into, into alternative articulations of crisis and crisis solving. And this is, this is the background why I aim to investigate into forms of decolonizing as potential tools of the crisis solving of the crisis of the everyday. And yes, this is the problematic and basically the puzzle and reflection underlying um, my thesis. So th thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, that's such a thought provoking um, conversation. And I'm sure Vinicius has lots to say. And hi, Mervyn. <laughs> I'm sure Marvin, uh, Mervyn will have lots to say too. Um, but um, for the moment, let's pass the floor over to Vinicius. Thank you very much. Um, and first of all, congratulations, Laura, for this presentation. Congratulations, Amanda, for putting together this this series that I think it is really um, bringing not only new voices, but uh, especially um, moving us around and trying to make us uncomfortable in the, in the comfortable seats we had um, about uh, what we think that we know. So I think it's a very beautiful exercise, epistemic exercise that you are promoting with this series and this talk of Laura together with that. Um, Laura, you put me in a very difficult situation to comment or discuss um, after such a, a sophisticated reading and presentation that you have made here. So um, I need really to, when I, when I got your paper to read, I really need to, to go back to my, my basis uh, in theological studies and especially in my basis on theology of liberation to, to get back to some uh, substantial thing to say uh, and comment on your, on your discussion. And as well as looking at um, what I haven't taught for quite a long time, in what I studied in my PhD, that was um, negative theology, um, especially. And I think that I will try to make some sense of all this uh, when I approach your presentation directly. Um, I have some comments on what you present and wrote and some questions that I think could ignite a conversation among, among us here. Um, the first question that I want to bring uh, is, uh, again, you, you pointed, you, 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 are, you have been very precise in what you are pointing here. Um, but I, I just want to start to asking like, um, are you accepting this grammar of crisis and accepting the sense that um, using the grammar as how I formulate my way of thinking? Yeah. So are you, are you accepting this grammar or you are looking at this grammar as something that I need to, um, as, a, as a negative and apophatic approach to remove this grammar and uh, understand that there are other grammars that can speak about uh, crisis and not necessarily this one that we are, um, and that you are criticizing very well in your presentation. And 
And there is some points in the presentation specifically that I would like to, to ask more. You constantly are talking about neoliberal slash modern crisis management. I would like to ask, are you taking neoliberal or neoliberalism as a synonym of modernity? Why is neoliberalism and modern together here, especially divided by this slash? Um, is, there, is there natural or inevitable for neoliberalism being modern or modern, modern modernity being neoliberal? How can we, we think on the syntaxes again of this dialogue or this, this, these two elements here, neoliberalism and modernity? Um, because what is interesting, um, that when you do that, you then come to talk about Foucault and norm. So talking about norms is also a modern uh, aspect of discussing it. So using the grammar of the neoliberalism, and that, that's what I'm trying to say about the question of the grammar of crisis. What's the grammar that we are criticizing? Are we using the same grammar as criticism to that, to that um, grammar that I want to criticize? So the question of normality and abnormality, um, is there any other probably outside this frame of philosophical modernity, especially in, uh, in post-structuralism that we could use? Because are we supposing that the, this entire planet uh, are seen ontologically and epistemologically and cosmologically the world in the same frames that Foucault is criticizing it? So, admitting that the Foucauldian criticism of norm is applicable, are we not generalizing as well and replicating this, this neo-colonial, or sorry, this, 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 a, a sort of neo-colonial sophisticated way of um, subordinate thoughts and subordinate epistemis as well? So those are questions that I think would be interesting to hear more about that. Uh, um, then, then there is one, one thing that, um, that really caught my attention and that's a provocation that I want to push you. You said, we, and I'm quoting you, we all have come across origin myths at some point. Think of Abrahamic religions, Adam and Eve. Origin stories explain who we are. As the colonial feminist scholar Sylvia Winter tells us, the exceptionality of human beings is our incapacity to pre-exist our origin stories. Well, that can be a very colonial perspective as well, no? So um, I can tell you about some indigenous tribes in the Amazon region that don't have original myths. They don't have at all. And even the, the language grammar that they have relate to, to, to temporality in a very different way that we relate to temporality. This, this question of past, present, future, the, the immanence of their experience with the world, it's much more related to what I have experienced and not what I have in memories. So it's especially one tribe called Piranhan, very well studied by Daniel Everett. Uh, and he published some books and texts about that, about Piranhan tribes, the tribe. Um, the Piranhan, um, for instance, um, they don't talk about generations that precede who they, they met. So they don't talk about grandparents if they haven't met this person. Um, this relationship with the immanence, with the, the experientiality, and not with the, the transformation, subjectivation of the experience, uh, it's a very interesting ethical approach here. And they are there and they exist. And they are humans as we are, and they don't have original myths. And their meaning as humans are not dependent or based on these original myths. So there is a, a paradox that I would like to push you to probably discuss it further. No? Uh, so, and then uh, coming to more like a general aspect of your, your discussion and presentation, um, we have talked about that before and you knew probably that I would push for it because you are, in my perspective, you are rounding, rounding around, but not touching. Um, in, in the ethical aspect of it, the fundamental question that your, your research is really doing. And this is a very important element that you have, uh, you have diagnosed. And I will be talking about, of course, the ethics of liberation of Henrique Dussel um, that you also have there, I know. <laughs> yes, and I was surprised that it was not there uh, in the bibliography because... Oh. Uh, 
<laughs> and it's not that's a mandatory thing, but I just think that uh, as we have been discussing that, I think what, what we, we can bring from this discussion of ethics of liberation of do so, it's what are the alternatives? You present as a very important diagnosis of a critical, uh, a critical picture of where we are, but what are the alternatives? What is the alternative to this, um, to this um, uh, homo economicus that you, you are presenting here? What are the alternatives for this, uh, this uh, ontology or this ontological crisis that you described so well and diagnosed so well? So it, it must be in a positive terms, philosophically, uh, cataphatically speaking, positive in this term, and cons consequently being also normative, or it must be apophatic, negative, and consequently abnormal. Can we admit a grammar of abnormality in the sense uh, I would put in these terms here? I would suggest you another reading, another philosopher that it's quite neglected, incredibly neglected, uh, Willem Flusser. I don't know um, if you came across Flusser's writings. You may think that, okay, that doesn't fit so well here, but Flusser, Flusser it's doing a very interesting phenomenological reading of history and especially in the contemporary, well, Flusser passed away in 1992, but what he wrote at, at, until that point was enough to, to see what we are looking at today and probably not having um, enough um, um, epistemological elements to discuss, but he puts it there and very strongly. And especially this, this discussion about does writing have a future? And, it's not a simple question of writing in itself, but it's the way of we have built up all this building of that we call knowledge, uh, that we call uh, rationality based on some, some models of grammaticality and even this grammaticality of crisis, even this grammaticality of abnormality, um, is that still uh, reasonable to talk in a post-history context as Flusser is pointing there in 1992 already. So I would recommend you to also uh, give a look at some of Flusser's writings. And you will have a privilege of reading Flusser in the language that he wrote, because he, he wrote in English, Portuguese, and, uh, and German as well, uh, sometimes the same text, but completely different from each other because of the grammaticality of each one of these languages. So I think that's an interesting exercise to, to rethink this, this aspect of changing the grammar and the implications that it will have. You know? um, uh, so, and, and then uh, I would just finalize my comment, comments here, quoting as well a passage of, um, of uh, Ethics of Liberation of Flus, uh, sorry, not Flus, for Dussel. Um, and it is the chapter four of that book when um, he starts, the title is The Ethical Criticism of the Prevailing System from the Perspective of the Negativity of the Victims. And again, it is a, it's an introduction to a chapter. It's nothing very objective what I am bringing here, but I just, again, listen to you and thinking about do so. I think the, the elements of this systemic approach that you both are doing um, must be more evident when you, when you develop your, uh, your thoughts and your writings. He says, this is an ethics of life. The negation of human life is now our subject. The clearest and most effective definitive point of departure for the entire framework of criticism that I have developed in this relationship produced between the negation of the corporeality, the bodily reality, Leiblichkeit, reflected in the suffering of the victims of all those dominated, and then the list is immense, as workers, indigenous people, African slaves, exploited Asians in the colonized world, as the bodily reality of women, of those who are not white, of the future generations who will suffer the effects of ecological destruction, all of the elderly without a place in a consumer society, uh, children abandoned in the streets, all those excluded because they are foreigners, immigrants or refugees, etc and the process by which the victims become conscious of the disnegation. And this is a, this chapter seeks to address the material contradiction between such negation and the consciousness it produces. It's, it produces. And that's, I think, the fantastic aspect that um, your, your research 
can bring it you know, to discuss. Those excluded, they are formulators of their own ethics and formulators of their own syntaxes on how to, to interact with this world, not simply as an object of our study, but as again, as formulators and formulators in a grammar that sometimes it's not the same grammar as we are. And consequently, sometimes in a grammar that crisis, it is not systemically possible. I will stop here. I probably haven't said anything so, so really clearly or uh, precise or even coherent, but I thought that we much better engage in what the thoughts that your presentation brought to me and bring in some of those questions to articulate with you. Thank you again and congratulations again. Um, wow, well, yeah, um, Vinicius, thank you so, so much for these really thought provoking uh, and challenging as well comments. And, uh, and, and I, I will give it a try to, to, to answer to some of them and to, to engage with them to the best of my current uh, you know, um, capability. Um, and I would love to start with your question about accepting the grammar, right? In how far am I accepting the grammar that I try to criticize? And um, here I need to say that I am in, in an early, in an, in an early stage of my research. I, am, I have just now basically formulated this research puzzle and, uh, and I am accepting the grammar in so far that this is the, the, the grammar I have grown up with. Right, in my own in my own position, um, and and this is the grammar that I that I kind of see around me. And so, and you're completely right because with the grammar, with terminology, comes also meaning. You know, prescribed meaning, and this is exactly what I criticize when I when when I ask what are crises. So. Um, uh, I, I, you are completely right. I am, I am not yet able to, to divorce myself from this grammar, but this is exactly the purpose of why I'm looking into alternative articulations to help me do that and, and to help others, you know, my readers who might be interested in my research to do that. So um, I, am, I am using the grammar and I'm showing what grammar is being used today to, to think about what are, the, what are the problems that we need to face to show that, 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 that the meaning doesn't quite add up with what we see outside, right? So we need to, we need to either fill these terminologies with a new meaning, and that might lead to, to completely different grammar, not just in a, in, in a lexical sense, but also in, in a worldview, right? And this is the purpose of my of my thesis. And uh, one one thing that I would love to engage with that was really indeed challenging, but you have, uh, but uh, mm, that you picked out the origin stories, right? And that origin and that everybody has got an origin story that they are incapable of pre-existing. And indeed, how um, what a kind of colonial. Uh, um, statement from, from a decolonial scholar, right? Because uh, as you have rightly pointed out, when we say that um, all humans have origin stories, well, origin stories already presuppose a specific idea of, of having a past and of seeing uh, and of, of, of experiencing time and of thinking about time. And, and uh, as you rightly pointed out, there is, for instance, when we look at the tribe that you have described, we have a blind spot. So this is a, a in, in, that, in that case, um, you know, when we speak of all humans uh, as the human kind, as, as, this, as, as, a, as this hybrid being, um, that might not, not apply to everyone, in fact. But I think, I think this is the beauty of engaging with ontological research to find those blind spots, and which also always caution us um, of, of exactly what we all, always approach to modernity of being uni universalizing and the, and the, total, and the totalizing uh, system. Um, 
these cases caution us to look at our own totalizations. Um, and I will definitely bring this into, in, incorporate that into my thesis and, and, uh, and I would love to read a little bit more about, about the case that you have read, the, tri the tribe. Uh, in terms of what are alternatives uh, to, to this ontological conflict? Again, this is what I want to look into. Um, and, and, and I specifically look into decolonial articulations of crisis because my, my question is, that, that, that kind of motivates me is to carve out, you know, what are the stakes in, in addressing the crisis of the everyday, so not addressing the crisis of the everyday and uh, those who, who I imagine, you know, but if we say if we say that crisis management is basically the safeguarding on of of of, of ruling norms in one way or, or another, either to conserving or transforming external um, externalities, then um, okay, I just had a blackout. I'm so sorry. Um, I need to gather my thoughts. It's okay, and I think um, while you while you get your thoughts back, I think um, as as I said in the beginning, the idea was to to have this provocation, indeed, and I don't have answers either for these questions that mm -hmm. I am bringing. You no, know? I and this positionality that we have as scholars, and normally dealing with an ontology and one epistemology that tends to be universalist or at least trying to explain the world um, in in general terms. Um, I think that's a, a, it's a very important reflection to bring, and your text and your research is pushing us in that direction. Is exactly how can we be scholars um, coming from one tradition of modernity, coming mm -hmm. from one tradition, a philosophical tradition of tradition of modernity, and one clear epistemology? How can we look at other possibilities of existence? not as abnormality. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And um, um, yeah, I, I got I got my, my line of thought back. Thank you very much, Vinicius. Um, so yeah, so, so my suggestion would be that uh, to look for alternatives that, you know, in, in knowledges that, that might have the less stake or the least stake in upholding those structures. And, and by which I'm, I'm not saying that the colonial scholars and scholar activists don't have a stake, don't have stakes in it, right? Um, we are all now sitting here in, 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 in this university and we all have our positionalities in that and, and also upholding these structures. But, but, um, but until now, as far as I know, um, at least in, in decoloniality, you find that the knowledge um, and, and the motivation and engagement with alternatives. And, um, and, and, to, and, and this is, this, I think this is a very good, um, good space to also try start something transformative um, in the structures where we are sitting. And um, finally, coming to, uh, coming to Enrique Dussel, indeed, um, and uh, and and finding alternatives and alternative ethical um, uh, thinking. And here I, I I might come back to you know this idea of corporeality, relationality, and situatedness of everyday life. Um, so I might I might um, expand a little bit on that uh, to, to say what I mean. And, and where we might find those alternatives. So, because, so corporeality and situatedness and, rela and relationality, they have a very much literal dimension, uh, but also an ethical dimension. And uh, when we look at Kantian ethics, that is kind of you know, have, has divorced, divorced the body from the mind and, and our bodies from, from other bodies, right? And from, and from, the, and, and from, from the body of our environment. Um, then, and, and basically has, uh, um, has projected the body and, uh, and, uh, the cor and, and carnal and carnality as the origin of evil 
uh, which, which kind of translates stream modernity uh, also into neo neoliberalism. Um, and when we look at, but we look at what you know, inspiration and loves come from, and how um, and, and creativity is kind of enacted in the world. But that comes from that comes from this this that that belongs for me to a corporeal kind of, um, kind of ethics, uh, a carnal ethics. And um, and interestingly, and, and Enrique Dussel is describing how millions of, of, for instance, indigenous peoples around the world uh, have 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 been living this carnal ethics and and um, uh, and saved much of it also through colonialism uh, to the present day. And I have, and I want to share just a very interesting example. So because I'm in, in AQC, so in the, in the um, I think, a King's Associateship Program, and we had a very, very good uh, and very fascinating presentation last week on Maori tattoos. And uh, I, was, I, I was quite fascinated to see how, um, how my thesis related with the presentation from, from this ethical stance, because so the presenter said how, um, uh, talked about the Maori definition of holiness. Uh, so, and they said that something is, is holy, that is tapu, um, which, has, which, is, which is embodying uh, divinity and embodied in, in the, and embodies uh, the, the force of of God. So this can be you know a very healing but also a destructive power. It can be a river. Um, it can be you know a, a person embodying tapu and uh, and talking about about uh, tattooing. Uh, it is also uh, in 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 the practice and art of of Maori tattooing that tapu is uh, enacted. So for them. Uh, Tapu is holy because, uh, like ta the tattoo, the art of tattooing is holy. It carries tapu because, because it touches the, the the blood and it brings out the blood from 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 the body. Uh, so, and the body itself is is the life force. So it is it is uh, it carries in itself that divine force, and so the dead body, for instance contains the essence of a person and is not denigrated and that is not objectified. Um, and and, um, and this, corp, this, corp, this is, this, I, I think this is an example for this carnal ethics, for corporeal ethics. And this also brings with itself as a result, this situated and, and communal way of, of living, um, I think, uh, which was also highlighted in, in representation. Um, and, and 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 I think that there are um, these ethical ethical views that, that can contest or that are able to contest this this Kantian formula, formulation of ethics. And it is just a question for my presentation: how do I how do I uh, how do I bring them in 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 conversation with that with that grammar that I try to sit that I tried to criticize. But this is all kind of in the future. <laughs> so now I just wanted to present my research puzzle. And uh, I, yeah, I, I'm, just going, uh, I'm just going to have a long think about your comments. And thank you so much, uh, Vinicius, for engaging with my presentation and my thesis in general. Thank you, thank you. It's a great pleasure and great honor. Um, a last recommendation of book as well. It's by Eduardo Viveiros de Castro. And the book's called From the Enemy's Point of View. I think it is a very, very good book that you will dialogue a lot with what's written there. <laughs> and thanks again uh, for, for inviting me to discuss your, your presentation, your research, what is always a pleasure for me. Also, thanks uh, again, Amanda, for your kind words in, in the introduction and for, for allowing me to, to talk here with you. I just think this, this is a great example of what a beautiful intellectual exchange looks like. And Laura, I just have to um, comment. Well, I don't have to, but I want to comment how absolutely brilliant you are and how you the, the your ability to articulate 
um, pretty difficult navigation of ontologies and different theoretical frameworks and you th synthesize them and, and um, present them in such um, a thoughtful, engaged and rigor way. And I just have to commend you on that in such an early part of your PhD that you're doing this. This is fantastic. So you are brilliant. And I think Vinicius's difficult questions when he was uh, posing them, I'm like, whoa, I think that's also just a testament to uh, his faith in your ability to even reflect and engage with them, right? So so that that's just my two cents I wanted to throw in. You're brilliant. And if you didn't know that, well, know that now. Um, so uh, there are no questions so far. I think probably people are, oh, wait, there is one. Good. Um, I was going to say people are just um, engaged in the conversation that um, lost for questions. But we do have one question here um, from Amar Archie, who says, thanks, Laura, for your presentation. I appreciate your centering the original myths, particularly with decolonial epistemic interventions. I'm particularly interested in the idea of the original myths and the so-called traveler's tales, which are core to the colonial identity. These myths often posit whiteness as normative. Such myths are reproduced and represented by and large by the colonial institution and form the basis of binary colonial identities opposed upon colonized bodies, especially around gender, sexuality, and race. Scholars in decolonial methodologies such as Fanon, Winters, Mimbe, and Chakrabarti particularly challenge notions of objectivity of the institution as the original myth in and of itself, which reinforce ideas of the primordialism of the other and negate the plural knowledges held by indigenous communities. I'm fascinated by the idea that an interrogation of these myths is implicitly an interrogation of the very identity of the institution. I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Wow, what a great reflection and discussion. Um, do you do you want to reflect on that at all um, in this moment, Laura? Um, I I I still do um, gather my thoughts. Um, I I still need to gather my thoughts. It, it, yeah. Perhaps there's um, uh, there are some other comments. Uh, I don't know if Mervyn wants to chip in. Sorry, Mervyn, I'm putting you on the spot, but I know ethics was uh, talked about um, quite a bit too. So I was thinking you might want to reflect or say something. Yeah, I'd love to. That that was very interesting, Laura. Thank you very much for that. And uh, I haven't read the paper, so my comments are merely on what I've heard now, but, but really a couple of questions. The one is about the meaning of, of this word crisis. Um, because crisis originally came from, you know, the people who use it most accurately, I think, are medics, doctors. So recently when I had the, the COVID and it got worse and worse and worse, and then I hit a crisis. This is a typical medical term. And when you get a crisis, they cart you off to hospital and they stick things in you and you hope you get out of there alive, you know. So for medics, a crisis is when certain indicators reach that level. So on that reading of the meaning of crisis, um, the notion of an ongoing everyday crisis that never stops, the word loses its meaning. So I guess my question is, once you've, as it were, made that move to make crisis cover an, an ongoing state of affairs, are you going to invent a different word for the everyday sense of crisis? So that's my first. And, and my, my second comment is about, is about ontology. So my understanding of ontology is there's a sense in which we've all got one. Uh, or since the Greeks, uh, those of us in that tradition have been brought up to believe we've all got an ontology. And it's about what we take to be being before we start philosophizing, there's this. And the one thing about ontology is that it's not something you can choose because the, it seemed to me in, in the way you were talking, it, it, as if, you know, let's go into the shop and find the ontology we like. <laughs> I don't think that's right. Um, so I would, 
one question I might ask is what's the ontology that's informing us here in our discussion today? And I wouldn't expect uh, you to, re I wouldn't even accept if I started musing about that, I wouldn't even accept the idea that no Mervyn, that's a wrong ontology, go and choose another one. Um, so so that, those are my two, two questions. Um, th thank you so much, Marvin. Uh, I have all the questions written down. I, I think we don't have much time to, uh, to, um, for me to reply to all of them, and I'm still gathering my thoughts. But um, as to, to your last question, Marvin, I think this is a very important one. And I think that I would love to, or maybe that would be the right moment to tell, uh, to tell you a little bit about how I approach problems. And what for me, what is for me ontology, and um, and why is ontological research so important for me in this specific research question? And I need to get uh, back uh, into my autobiography a little bit there because from uh, in in the in the previous uh, university where I was in in Germany in the University of Passau, I have just be, just uh, because based on pure curiosity, um, have made a, um, a certificate in digital humanities. And it uh, seems very far-fetched. I'm going to explain what this has to do with ontology in my view. So digital humanities um, is basically when we take, uh, when we take uh, digital tools like coding, et cetera, um, uh, and software to help us solve questions uh, in the humanities, right? For example, when you make a, uh, a map, a Google Maps of the of, of medieval times. There was, I think, something like that. Um, uh, that that would be something digital humanities do, and of course, three D photography and digitalizing uh, documents, etc., to make them easier accessible. And so, I have been engaging with with coding. Uh, and I don't know much about coding anymore. I have forgotten a lot, but it has influenced ab about how I go about problems. Right, so. When you have, uh, um, so, so what, what a digital humanities, humanist or an informatician would do, um, they see a software and they see something is wrong with the software. So what, what does the person do? They go into the source code uh, of that software and they try to figure out where is the bug. And they try to, um, to do something, like to change something in the source code, which then when we again leave the source code, um, it makes suddenly the software work better. And so for me, um, when I, it changed a lot of my way of approaching questions. So when I started here in, in, in King's College, um, it was, I was also, I wanted to, to engage with crisis, but specifically in the, in the context of the Second World War. And so I just say that something wasn't adding up. Um, and so something wasn't adding up into how crisis management, as I would see it and, and formulate it, is going about crisis. It, so it can't really, so it's, it's crisis solving potential wasn't really as, as expected, right? So it didn't add up. And in my mind, that's the software. <laughs> so what I do now is that I go into the source code of the software and the source code for, for me, um, coming from digital humanities um, would be would be the ontology. So for me, ontology, I see it as as a humanist source code, right? But the so the um, and and um, I just have here um, a quote by Charles Mills that I always have displayed actually on my laptop because because this is uh, ontological research is basically delving into the source code um, of our problems and of modernity and etc. That is, uh, I think that is quite, um, uh, that, that is what, what most decolonial scholars do. So here's, for instance, a quote by Charles Mills, uh, where he says that, so, um, and he's talking about, uh, about uh, moral theories. And he says that what is really making uh, the, 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 the variable that makes the most difference to the fate of non-whites is not to find or even coarse-grained conceptual divergences between different theories. So, which theory might be better? Um, you know, um, uh, social, like um, liberalism or, or conservatism or socialism. But it is just 
whether or not the subclass of the racial contract uh, is evoked. So whether, whether that theory, that particular theory is put into Heron folk mode. Um, so this is the question. It, it's, not, it's not really the details. And for me, it's, it's, not, it's not even the, the, the details of price management. What I want to say is, that is whether in any articulation of crisis management, of how, of how governments in a concrete situation might go about solving a crisis, whether there, um, what is the fundamental norm? What is the norm? What is that existential core um, that is animating crisis management? And that for me is ontology. Um, so crisis management is you know, the epistemology and, and crisis, what are crises? Uh, is 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 the this is for me the ontological question the big difference between just you know software and you know for instance crisis management is that when you go into a software and you go into the source code well you you, you see what is right you see you see the source code you see what what is there but when you go into ontology uh, in the humanities for me what's fascinating that often it doesn't it doesn't only tell you what is, or it can tell you what is. Obviously, it's very difficult to find source, human source code. Um, um, but think of, for instance, the sexual contract by Carol Pateman, um, you know, the racial contract by Charles Mills. That's just for me like coding, like source coding, basically. Um, and, and, the, and the difference is that there it doesn't only, my, it, does, it doesn't only show you what is, but also what could have been. So for me, Ontology, yeah, it's not just what is there, but what could be there and what could have been in particular moments of history. And for me, when I do ontological research and I look into, you know, alternatives, um, that is what I, I, I don't mean that we can just choose an ontology, but, but I, I say that there is the possibility of, of profound change. Um, that is really so profound that it reaches our coding, right? Our source codes as humans and, um, and as humans in today's world. Um, and I don't know if that, if that answers or if that just made everything much more confused, but this is what I can tell about my, my approach to ontology and my approach to, to, to research questions in general. Laura, that, that was a marvelous answer. That is a really very good answer because um, <clears throat> it, it makes it clear what you're getting at. And, and as you were talking now, I was thinking about my example of that kind of reasoning would be uh, in apartheid South Africa, the ontology was race, you know, and the norm to be maintained was, uh, you know, white racial purity. Um, and it fits with everything you said now. And then it also uh, fits a kind of strategic communication maneuver that the government made, which was to declare a crisis that was ongoing. So they instituted all sorts of abnormal measures, doing away with human rights, habeas corpus, processes of law and so on. And they did it on a permanent basis saying, we face a crisis and the crisis was uh, referring back to the norm that you would say is the ontological norm. Thank you. Marvellous. Thank you so much, uh, Marvin. And uh, yeah, but my, my hat is a little bit, is a little bit smiling. I know there have been more questions. I don't know if I'm in the right space to answer them now, but um, in any way, um, I can, I'm very happy to leave my, my email address here uh, for, if anybody would like to reach out, I'm always happy to engage in these conversations. Um, yeah, but th thank you very much. That's great. And we're over time, um, but I don't mind because this was such an enriching intellectual conversation. So 
Um, I want to thank you all, um, you know, Laura, especially for presenting such an articulate and fascinating uh, presentation and for um, uh, Vinicius and for Mervyn, but also for our audience members for engaging and asking uh, those brain buzzing questions, right? And Laura, it's okay not to have the answer right now, right? This is the, this is supposed to, you know, um, help you build and develop um, your project. So when it comes time to publish your book. It's going to be an amazing book and you're going to blow us all away. So uh, in the meantime, yes, thank you all for coming again. And uh, hopefully I will see you next Wednesday. Thank you again, um, Laura and everyone for showing up and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you.